Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Pillars of Eternity with me, Break It Down. Let's check out the Temple of Andra. Right. Keeping quiet. Okay, this is where Akrun stuff is at, most likely. Carvings dedicated to Andra adorn every inch of this large wooden chest. His lid appears firmly secured, even with no latch or locking mechanism in sight. Inspect the chest. The chest seems old. It's wood cracked and bleached by the passage of time. Before you can take a closer look, Nacolite snaps around to face you. Don't touch that. His voice cracks like a whip. The other Acolytes look at him as if to urge some composure. He frowns. I mean to say, that's sacred to Andra. Please, leave it alone. If secrets whisper here, I shall listen for them. The young man dressed in sturdy leathers glares at you. The creases in his face, and despite the scarce sunlight of the region, suffer a slight twitch as you approach him. I have nothing for you. You could lofta if you must. He turns away, his nose wrinkled. Veins course under this woman's pale skin, like icy fissures yet. When she speaks, her voice flows warm and soothing. Andra welcomes you in her embrace. Her features soften with compassion. We're here to ease the pain of your past, ready to take your burdens. With a thin smile, she nods. You let the goddess help you with your hardships, of course. Tell me about Andra. Andra's the goddess of redemption, deep like an ocean and gentle as a mother. She's here to relieve her children of their darkest burdens. We came here to aid the villagers, to heal the wounds of the past that fester in their souls. I thought Andra was the goddess of loss and mourning, not redemption. That's a... The priestess crosses her arms and shifts her weight. Common notion. Others may believe so, but the goddess's mysteries are profound. Her true power lies in redeeming your loss and regret. Or is there something else you wanted to talk about? I want to know about the gift bearers. Gift bearers do Andra's most valued work. They carry the material burdens of unfortunate souls into her embrace, so that the goddess may help them forget. I heard that worshippers of Bereth visited you recently. Little happens around here that doesn't end in the mouths of villagers, who are obliged to assist everyone, regardless of their faith. A group of women came to us, yes. The leader wanted to know of Durgan's battery. I obliged, and pointed them in its direction. They left as quietly as they arrived, which didn't make any of us less concerned about their true intentions. This place has grown dangerous enough already. I want to ask you about Akrun's heirloom. The dwarf already asked, but gave him the counsel he needed. Slight irritation sharpens her tone. She seems to catch herself, modulating her voice back to a pleasant timbre. And naturally, we'll do what we can for you too. Ask what you will. Akrun wants his medallion back. She brings her hands together and nods. Ah, Akrun. Often we let the shadows of the past become a burden even to others. That medallion, it weighs on Akrun's mind. If you're kind to help, what he really needs is to cast away those memories. Isn't that for him to decide? He did. He understood the solace that the goddess can give to those like him. It was explained to him that many have second thoughts. One does not withdraw something offered to a goddess. In time, the memories fade. They come to see the wisdom of their original pledge. His belongings, his past, now rest in Andra's realm, to be forgotten so that the wounds of the soul may heal. This is the will of the goddess. Well, let's suppose Akrun has moved on. Tell me where his heirloom is. He hasn't, and that's the point. Lofta crosses her arms. Besides, you have no authority here. I wonder what the village's leader would have to say about that. You think we don't act in accordance with the local customs? 
The village knows we're here to help the unfortunate, like Akrun. They trust us. I can keep asking for a long time. A flash of color invades the priestess's pale skin. I see there is no dissuading you, and you seem... She glances you over. A person of will. Very well. Akron's heirloom was taken by Ixtli, chosen gift bearer among us, to be cast away as an offering to Andra. Only he knows where. She pauses and looks at you intently. You could ask him yourself, but he's on a trek through the mountains of Durgan's battery. If you run into Ixtli, tell him he has urgent duties to attend here. Tell me about your gift bearer. Ixtli had business near Durgan's battery. Those mountains are dangerous. If you insist upon carrying out this request of Akrun's, then that's where I'd search for answers. It's hard to believe that only the gift bearer knows where Andra's offerings are cast away. Is it? Our goddess frees us from our earthly burdens. It's best if only one of us knows where they are taken, lest we end up suffering under their weight. Let me ask you about something else. A farewell. So I wonder if his armor is in this chest then. Something else altogether. Oh, we're locked out. <laughs> okay. As you step outside, the heavy wooden door of the temple slams shut behind you. You hear someone barring it from the other side. It sounds like the priests have engaged in an agitated conversation. You get the sense that they are discussing you. But you're also certain that the door is too thick to eavesdrop through. Although there may be other places nearby where you'd stand a better chance. Can't believe this. The wooden shutters of the temple's window close tight. Muffled set of voices coming from within the building. You can't quite make sense of the murmur, but cracking a shutter open would likely help. Rusty iron latch, sorry, a rusty iron latch holds the window shutters closed. With care, you should be able to unfasten it without being noticed. You unfasten the latch. You carefully begin to lift the latch from its metal hook. Halfway there, the rusted iron resists with a screech. You freeze, listening to the voices in hopes the priest didn't hear. Their conversation continues uninterrupted. Yeah, pour some oil on the latch. You have the latch and apply just the right amount of oil, nudging the metal until its rust gives way without a sound. Carefully, you pull the window shutters open enough to let the voices flow through. You hear a man speaking, his tone agitated. You do that. Both the mountains will do it. What if Ix... His sentence cuts, as if the man were speaking to all sides of the room. Suppose he tells them instead. What then? You recognize Lafta's voice responding. Why would he? Without those dangers near the battery, our gift bearer won't delay. I expect the... The man interrupts her. You always expect. Look where that's taken us. A dying village. Ogres at the walls. Ixley's not back yet. Now I have to do his pot. His voice is it. His voices. His voice drops and seethes. Muffling what he has to say. After a moment, Lofter replies. You think I wanted this? That I could have known in advance? A pause ensues. His tension growing until the priestess's voice cuts it in half. We can't wait for him. We must fish out the last batch quickly. After that, we'll decide. The man responds in a broken voice, barely audible. You only distinguish the last words. In that rusted wood pond, I'll go. The exchange seems to end. Cautiously, you step away from the window of Andra's temple. I had a feeling something was up, because we've had two members of the temple break their composure. 
uh, both Lofta and X, X something. The guy whose name starts with the Q. Say, I don't suppose you've seen any mysterious old buildings in the mountains lately, have you? The Amoa wears an assortment of bangles, bands, cuffs, and chains as thick as armor. She watches you with a raised eyebrow and eyes gleaming with mirth. You mean Durgan's Battery? No, but I've heard that name a lot around here. I'm looking for the Abbey of the Fallen Moon. It's an obscure temple dedicated to Andra. Why are you looking for the Abbey? I'm a gift bearer. My job is to gather tokens of things people want forgotten and surrender them to the Lady of Lament. Best place to do that is the Abbey of the Fallen Moon. What kinds of tokens do you take? Anything that represents a moment or a memory someone wishes to leave behind. Well, love notes, awkward family heirlooms, bad poetry, the kinds of things you want to forget. I see. I might be here a while. Half the villagers have never heard of the Abbey, and the ones that have, no one knows where it is. So I'm trying to think of this as an extended holiday in a remote mining village that smells like fish. I've got business in the region. We could travel together. You won't regret it. I've got a lovely singing voice. And the company's welcome. She winks at Palagina. Okay, so I would like to use the DLC companions in the DLC. The first one I'm tempted to get rid of is Grieving Mother. So they give me a lot of melee characters, though. But she's really the only one I don't need. I don't really need Aloth as well, since I don't use his crowd control spells nearly as often as I should. I will wait in the place of your strength. It yeah, will leave her back. our stronghold. We'll bring her along instead. Alright, what she got going on? Good might, good constitution. Barbarian, Kosomoa. Alright, let's take a look at what she's got. Tell me! It's a barbaric yell. Let's add a terrifying yell, frightening enemies in the area of effect. Anything of note? All right, all these can be gotten rid of. We'll give her some better equipment. This is uh, Manea's armor. Yeah, she never introduced us. Did introduced herself? Did she? She never told us her name. The plus one move speed. So good. I can keep her in the back line in case we're ever ambushed and have her just run to the front once everybody else is in position. Then also plus twenty five percent healing received. Manea's armor reflects her extensive travels and experiences on the roads and waves of Eora. It incorporates brass baubles, the teeth of ferocious creatures, and myriad small bits of fashion Manea took a fancy to on her adventures. Fantastic. Uh, does she have weapon focus yet? Well, we're about to level her up. Towering Physique. Koso and Moa are renowned for their natural sea legs and sturdy builds. Whether it's due to their long history of seafaring or something that has been innate within them for generations, all Coastal Moa have an inherent resistance to being stunned or knocked prone. Carnage. The Barbarian's attacks become so forceful as to impact others around the target enemy. For every successful melee attack, the Barbarian makes, redu makes reduced damage attacks at all other enemies within a short distance of the target. I misread that there uh, for a second. But I did not. Alright, let's see what weapons we have. Take stock before I select which weapon focus for her. Right, so we have clubs, we have... We could do Ruffian. Because I know we have a club and a saber. Those are both one-handed. I wouldn't mind someone using uh, Ravenwing either. This be okay too, because she gets bonus uh, healing received. We could try this. What is this? Fine. We don't have any two-handed besides Palagina and 
um endurance of course but that's for reach weapons So let's see, 2029. Yeah, I'll probably go with the self heal. I, mean, I could do wield, but it's not like dual wielding. So. Yeah, let's go ahead and give her this. That's right, she can't do both. That's fine. I don't need boots, belts, or gloves, or helmets. Nope. Ah, good enough. Uh. Alright, let's level her up. Right, so focus on athletics. A little bit of survival in there as well. Right, so accurate carnage. The barbarian learns to line up his or her most savage blows, improving the accuracy of secondary attacks from carnage. Okay, plus five accuracy to those. Fantastic. Right, so frenzy sends the barbarian into a frenzied state, granting a might, constitution, and attack speed bonus, but causing a deflection penalty against incoming attacks. While the barbarian's frenzy is active. His or her endurance and health are concealed. The plus four might, plus four constitution, plus 33% attack speed. A savage defiance. The barbarian channels his or her own irrepressible determination, regenerating a large amount of endurance. Once per encounter. It's also one per encounter. A blooded. Causes the barbarian to lash out when in pain, bringing a bonus of damage for as long as his or her endurance is below 50%. Then wild sprint. Barbarian becomes able to charge with reckless abandon, allowing him or her to ignore the movement stop of engagement and gain bonus to all defenses against disengagement attacks. We'll go with Frenzy. Reduce her deflection, and then we'll go with Blooded, I think. Yeah, Frenzy first. Okay, uh, Greater Frenzy. I don't see why not. I cultivates the Barbarian's inner rage, granting additional bonuses while under the effects of Frenzy. An extra plus two to Might and Constitution. Ooh, new stuff. So I was going to get blooded, but we have Brute Force now. The Barbarian hits so hard that ordinary means of defense can be easily overpowered. On attacks that normally target deflection, the Barbarian will instead attack Fortitude, but it is a lower defense. That's nice. One stands alone. The Barbarian makes a courageous stand against all attackers. Grants a melee damage bonus when the Barbarian is adjacent to two or more enemies. And the Barbarian cannot be flanked unless engaged by more than three enemies. Bloodlust. Imparts an unquenchable bloodlust to the Barbarian. Increasing his or her speed temporarily in battle once he or she has personally downed at least two enemies. I like that one too. Let's go with Blooded first. A barbaric Blow. The Barbarian deals a massive blow, causing additional crits and extra damage on crits. Carnage is not affected. That's a plus 25% ability area of effect. Plus 30% of hits converted to crits. And plus 0.5 to crit damage multiplier. Julio. Uh, 
more new stuff. So thick skinned. Toughens the Barbarian's naturally thick skin, raising his or her damage reduction. The plus three damage reduction against slash, pierce, and crush. Threatening presence. Barbarian's mere presence becomes so intimidating as to fill all approaching enemies with nauseating dread. As long as the Barbarian is stationary, nearby enemies may be sickened. Bloodthirst. After killing an enemy, the Barbarian's recovery is waived, allowing them to attack again immediately. Seems really good too. I think I'm going to go with Brute Force. Because all this does is increase the likelihood of her landing her attacks. So I don't see why I wouldn't get that. Okay, we need to get a weapon focus type. Who focuses on the knight does? So yeah, weapon focus knight uh, for the morning star bonus. All right, Barbaric Shout lets out a dreadful shout, terrifying enemies in the air of effect, and Vengeful Defeat exacts a final revenge when the Barbarian re reduced to zero endurance, causing him or her to perform instant carnage full attacks at everyone in range. I'm going to get Bloodlust. When she kills two enemies, she gets that 20% attack speed bonus. I actually think Savage Attack is worth getting. Because you can target one of two fences, either Fortitude or Deflection. So yeah, we'll grab a uh, Savage Attack. By attacking with Unbridled Ferocity, characters are able to sacrifice melee accuracy for a significant boost in damage. Also makes her heal bigger as well. Yeah. Yeah, we'll keep her in the back. And once combat starts, we'll have her run into the front. Oh, let's go check out the fishery next. Lord Sidrock. A wealthy noble by the name of Lord Sidrock has arrived at the stronghold. He seeks your aid in defending his keep from his rivals. We have eight days to do that, so we'll finish exploring this place. We'll head back to Cadnua afterwards. Fresh fish! Freshly caught! That smells never washing off. I don't have anyone that can stealth now. That's okay. I don't need to steal anyway. This tattered net appears to have been set aside for mending. Laying low. These roasting fish provide much of the pungent odor permeating, permeating the fishery. The dead eyes of a speckleback, iron tooth pike, and frost diver fish gaze up at you. Fishery's closed for the night. I need to wait till daytime? Fred! Effigy's eyes! It looks at me! Cool. I realize it's actual breath effects for your characters. A dozen pairs of gl globular eyes stare up piteously from the discarded heads of the day's catch, awash in a pungent sea of fins and innards. Sift through the fish scraps. 
Your hand runs up against something round and fleshy, the size of a melon. It is smooth and scaleless, and parts seem to be covered in hair. A discarded head, perhaps, but not that of a fish. Poke the head. The head shifts deeper into the barrel's slimy recesses. Pull out the head. With one hand on either side of the head, you begin to lift it out of the barrel, only to have it leap from your grasp as the head's owner springs over the lip of the barrel in an eruption of fish chunks that rain down over the market stall. The man who leapt from the barrel stands facing you, nearly naked save for a loincloth and <laughs> drizzled in fish viscera. He is covered head to toe in scars, hairs and punctures, and the thorny imprints of lashings. Most are faded, like old memories. Despite that, the addition of the man's body is remarkable. The drooping skin at his flanks and elbows are the only evidence of his advanced age. His face is placid, but the rest of him appears prepared for anything. You must forgive, Zawa. I was not expecting you. He looks you in the eye at first, but his gaze drifts now and then, settling on strange parts of your face, as though distracted by new discoveries. He is at all flustered, he gives no indication. What were you doing in that barrel? Zahua scratches behind his ear, dismayed. Resting my eyes, I thought. Waiting for the Malkachoa to bring me insight. He shakes his head. It would seem I dozed. A good thing my master was not alive to see it. Zahua blinks, leaning in to get a better look at you. His enlarged pupils seem to crowd out his pale irises. Are you... Are you real? Yes. Of course. I meant no offense, but I find it is best to ask when Malkachoa is involved. Malkachoa? A small white mushroom. I have heard it called Snowcap in these lands. It can reveal the true nature of many things. You have a master, you said. The man traces your inadvertent glance at his scars. He smiles politely. A teacher, not an owner. Zawa is a free man. Well, as free as any of us. I, I still don't understand why you were in that barrel. I was freeing myself from vanity. Did he say sanity or vanity? Consider, how can one be vain who is bathed in the smell of dead fish? There's a proud glint in his eyes. Hard to argue with that. I had the idea when I passed this way earlier. I am pleased with the results so far. He smiles at the woman whose head is swiveled towards him as he passes by, a look of revulsion on her face. Distracted, her toe catches on a stone and she nearly falls on her face. He claps his hands together. <laughs> yes, quite pleased. He laughs triumphantly. Those scars are from battle. Zawa glances down at his body. From battle, yes. I left them upon my enemies. He points at various patches of crisscrossing scars. These were struck against fear. These against pleasure. These against hatred. Those down there against greed and doubt. And these... He points to his face. These were for vanity. You made those scars. I cannot take credit for all of them. But I did most of the good ones. His mouth perks. I put them there in battle to remind myself what is real and what is not. Our worst enemies are inventions of the mind, pleasure, fear. When we see them for what they are, we become unstoppable. And you have achieved this. I feel I have been close, but never for more than an instant. In the moment when the pain is sharpest, the world becomes clear. In that moment, I am a match for anyone. Gives a slow, assured nod. Your wounds must have caused you to suffer greatly. Of course. I am fortunate to have suffered so much. If I did not suffer, I would not aspire to free myself from it. I would wander from one unfulfilling goal to the next. More wealth, a better station, my soul would wither. But to search for a place beyond suffering's reach 
is to nurture the soul, to harden it against the elements. He clenches his fists in illustration. Suffering is the greatest gift the gods have given us, the most beautiful, perfect creation. It is the hand that turns the wheel. His eyes gleam as though looking upon an old and beloved friend. You often smear yourself with fish. <laughs> gods, no. What a way to travel the world. He chuckles. The usual way is to smear yourself with the ashes of the dead. But they do not burn their dead here, so I have to make do with what the land provides. He sniffs the air. Hmm. The cold seems to conquer the smell. Even now, the scent hides itself. Disappointing. You don't seem like you're from around here. I was visiting a monastery, not far from here. I found it empty, but I met a messenger as I left. He carried a call for aid. Seeing that he would find no monks at the monastery, I chose to go in their place. Zawa is no longer young, but in combat he is still the greatest of the Takan people. It seemed only right that he should go. Starwart hired me as well. I would not say I am hired. I seek no wage, and I promise no result. He shrugs. I have chosen a path, and my spoils come from walking it. An uneasy frown settles on his face, almost a wince. And this fortress, this Durgan's battery, its people are gone. Zawa would know why. You seek the White Forge as well. I could use the help of an experienced warrior. Zawa's face tilts upward, his eyes fixing on the sky. He remains motionless, entranced. At length, he blinks as if awakening and looks back at you. He shrugs cheerily. If one wishes to swim, it is no time to argue with the current. We are here, together, in this moment, because a perfect force has willed it. Who is Zawa to argue? He looks you squarely in the eyes, and for once, they do not drift. I will walk with you so long as the gods wish it so. Let's be on our way. Okay, who to replace here? I might replace Adair. We're gonna be very melee heavy. He's a monk. It's only for the DLC as well. See you when I see you. I'm ready. I don't like getting rid of Adair, but I think this will be better. Zawa is ready. The Fighting Spirit. All folk have an indomitable spirit that rises to the challenge when things look grim. If our folk is below 50% endurance, they gain a bonus to accuracy and damage. Torment's Reach. This ability, ability exploits the shared bonds of universal suffering between all things. The initial target is hit with a powerful blow that does additional crush damage. Enemies in a cone behind the target suffer crush damage and have their might reduced. Transcendent Suffering. Monks achieve greater understanding of their body's capabilities through enduring the hardships of existence. Their base and arm damage starts much higher than other characters, and increases permanently every three levels they gain. That's just gonna be unarmed. Not a weapon focus for that, is there? He does have a point into stealth. Maybe instead of survival, I'll give him stealth in lieu of uh, Grievy Mother. Alright, so Lesser Wounds. Lowers the Monk's Wound Threshold, allowing him or her to gain wounds at a faster rate. Alright, uh, Swift Strikes. The Monk's hands become a frenzied blur of attacks, increasing their attack rate for a brief period. A Turning Wheel. The monk is able to channel physical pain into pure energy and redirect it at his or her attackers. 
While the monk has wounds, here she adds a proportional fire bonus to melee damage. Long stride. Intense practice and years of study enable the monk to move with confidently, confident fluidity in battle. During combat, the monk's movement rate is significantly increased. Yeah, plus two is pretty good. Uh, force of Anguish. A powerful attack that knocks the a target back a significant distance if the attack is successful. Target bumps others out of the way and bounces off hard surfaces like walls before ending up prone. I'm going to grab Turning Wheel. Right, uh, mortification of the Soul. The monk immediately inflicts enough raw damage on himself or herself to gain a wound. Alright, Stunning Blow. A head targeting strike designed to disrupt enemies' ability to react. Enemies hit by a successful attack are stunned. A clarity of Agony. Through pain, the monk is able to cleanse his or her body, reducing the duration of incoming existing hostile effects by half. Soul Mirror. Calls upon the power of the monk's psyche, reflecting half of ranged missiles targeting only the monk back to their point of origin. Only attacks resulting in a miss have a chance to be reflected back. Let's do Swift Strikes, the bonus attack speed. You get all of these? You get the fire and the shock damage? We'll try it anyway. This wasn't unlocked until this point. It energizes the monk's swift strikes, causing anyone hit by the attack to take additional shock damage. Alright, Crucible of Suffering. The monk gains temporary insight through endurance getting a temporary bonus to Fortitude, Reflex, and Will whenever Hostile Effect expires. Duality of Mortal Presence The monk gains two modal abilities that allow him or her to switch between a bonus to Deflection and a bonus to all of their defenses. Rooting Pain There is a shockwave around the monk each time he or she gains a wound, inflicting a small amount of damage too, and possibly calling an interrupt on all enemies in the area of effect. The Long Pain. The monk becomes capable of projecting force from his or her fist, inflicting damage at long range. Let me grab Duality of Mortal Presence. And then I think there's no reason to use any of these, right? Does his unarmed count as dual wielding? Also, I need to grab this for Minea and possibly for my main character as well, but that, that comes later. Yeah, I don't know if this counts. I assume it does, right? We're going to try it. We can always respec. I forgot to read what it does. Um, yeah, so two weapon style. Specialized training increases the character's attack speed while using a weapon in each hand. Enervating Blows. By targeting certain points on an enemy, the monk is able to inflict physical weakness. Melee critical hits cause the target to become weakened. I like Stunning Blow. We'll grab that next. We'll grab Scion of Flame, and then we'll also get Heart of the Storm at some point. 
It increases burn damage and damage reduction. It does fire damage with his fists now. Zawa is ready. And turn that Zawa on. Is ready. And we're gonna change up our party formation. I'll be in the front. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I am now the primary tank. All right, I'm gonna call it here. Uh, next episode, we'll continue exploring Stalwart Village. We got a little off track since we found a couple new companions. I think the DLC has one more companion. Um, that's some knowledge I didn't mean to have going into it, but I do. Yeah, we'll go from there. Now let's go and move him up here, and her up here. Lead the way. Like that. Well, this is also modal. Huh? All right. I'm gonna call it here, and we'll continue next time. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you guys in the next one.